Yes, okay. So um, I'll be approaching this uh, differently looking at uh, cancer exomes, uh, specifically at sporadic cancers. Um, I'm a PI who works on melanoma genetics, um, but this could be applied uh, to other cancer types. So it's well accepted that cancer is a genetic disease. One of the best examples for this is colorectal cancer, where you have a development of, from a normal epithelial cell all the way to a metastasis. And these various morphological stages are linked to various molecular changes seen right here. Now, this has become a paradigm for other solid cancers. Even though a cancer has been looked at genetically in depth, we still are at the tip of the iceberg, and many more alterations are to be found out. So I'll start talking about the platform setup to look for somatic mutations in cancer genomes. So there are three main hurdles for this. The first is establishing a very high quality tissue bank. The next is the sequencing of very large quantities of samples. And finally, the analysis of the large number of base pairs for these mutations. These are just two examples of discoveries using unbiased sequencing approaches, uh, two kinases um, that have been found to be highly mutated in different cancer types and that have FDA-approved uh, drugs. BRAF has a recently FDA-approved drug. And so even though there are these hurdles, obviously it's worth moving forward and looking for these alterations. So um, I'll start talking about the tumor bank establishment. Uh, so we have here um, an example from breast cancer where you could start off by getting the primary breast tumor, uh, or you could get the metast or and you could get the metastatic uh, brain tumor. Uh, you could get these as fresh tumors or embedded. Some of these tumors could be turned into cell lines, uh, which could be useful as well for a tumor bank. And some of these uh, samples could be turned into a xenograft in an immunodeficient mouse. Once you have this genomic DNA, you could start looking at genome-wide DNA sequencing. So uh, what are the advantages and challenges for these various sources? Uh, so the advantage for the fresh uh, frozen tumor or an OCT block is obviously that you have highly reliable data. This is closest to the actual tumor that was resected. However, uh, usually you have very limited amounts of DNA from this source. It is heterogeneous because uh, you'll have different clones of cells populating that uh, uh, tumor. And it is a labor-intensive extraction. It will require a pathologist uh, to find out where the uh, tumor lies, and then you will get, get either macro or laser capture micro dissection to get out the tumor cells. Paraffin embedded tissue, again, highly reliable data. The challenge, again, you'll have limited amounts of DNA. It's going to be heterogeneous. Again, you'll need a pathologist um, uh, to determine where the tumor cells are. And with the paraffin embedded tissue, you will have DNA quality issues as well because of the fixation procedure and the embedding procedure. Cell line, of course, will have a lot of DNA. Uh, it's going to be mostly homogeneous because you have a, set, a clone of cells that are being expanded in tissue culture. Uh, the extraction is usually very simple. There are cases where it's more of a challenge, for example, in melanoma, because you have melanin being produced. That could affect PCR reactions, so you have to work on making sure that you don't have melanin in that DNA. And of course, a cell line could be useful for downstream functional studies. Uh, but we have to make sure that the alterations that are identified in the cell line do represent the original tumor. So it is worth going back to that original fresh tumor to make sure that the alterations are found there as well. A xenograft, again, we have a lot of DNA. It's homogeneous. The extraction is simple. However, again, we may need to make sure that the alterations are similar to original tumor. It is expensive to make xenografts more than uh, the other uh, sources. And finally, you will get mouse DNA contamination, and so that would affect your analysis down the line, and you need to keep that in mind. Okay, the other part of your tumor bank is going to be that you need your normal tissue. Remember, we're looking for somatic mutations. So usually blood would be a, a, an excellent source for this DNA. However, it's not always available. And if you're looking at a leukemia, for example, of course, it's not going to be relevant. 
um, so you could go to neighboring tissue, but there you have to be ca careful because you might have some contaminating tumor cells. And now that we're looking at in-depth sequencing, you will be able to pick up these contaminating tumor cells in the neighboring supposedly normal uh, cells. You want to have as much clinical information as possible about your patients. So the date of birth, date of death, date of diagnosis, the malignancy stage, the location of your primary and metastatic tumors, and the various therapies that uh, the patients underwent. So this is an example of the tumor bank that we established, but obviously this is applicable to any cancer type. So in this case, we have metastatic tumor DNA, the matched normal, in our case it's blood, the OCT block, so the original fresh tumor, uh, as well as the matched cell line. So alterations in the cell line could always be gone and tested again in the fresh tumor. The cell line allows RNA being made, uh, as well as protein lysates, and finally clinical information. I'd like to point out that we have here three different cohorts. It's uh, really worthwhile getting several cohorts um, in order to be able to validate your genetic data. Each one of your cohorts have particular bottlenecks. And so you want to make sure that filters are being applied for the various uh, cohorts and not uh, affecting uh, your results. So it really is worth spending the time on getting these additional cohorts. So once you have your tumor bank, there are several quality controls that are worth considering. The first is SNP detection to make sure that the tumor and your normal tissues are matched. The second is uh, to implement an assay to determine that the fraction of the tumors are 75% or above. That is because if it's below that, there's a chance that you will not see loss of heterozygosity or homozygous alterations. Uh, the assay that we use in our case is looking for melanoma antigens um, using immunohistochemistry. Uh, but obviously for different cancers, different assays would be applied. Uh, then a third quality control is the mutation analysis of known mutated genes to see whether the percentage that you identify in your tumor bank is similar to what's known in the literature. So uh, this is just a schematic of a somatic mutation analysis where you have your patient, the tumor is dissected, you have your normal tissue. In some cases, you can get a cell line. You extract your DNA, you sequence the gene of interest. You do the same for your normal tissue, and then you compare those sequences. Now we're looking at a somatic mutation, any difference between the normal and the tumor. Now in this case, we're looking at the coding regions as well as flanking 15 base pairs, flanking the exons to look for splice site variations as well. So if in the past uh, we used candidate approaches, now with whole exome and whole genome, we can start being much less biased. And so, as mentioned previously, um, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, is applying a whole exome and whole genome sequencing to cancers. Um, so this is probably the largest uh, industry to provide all this data. Uh, and so uh, they said that there will be at least 3,000 new cancer cases by the end of September 2011, and they are on target. So um, I'll move on to looking at exomes. and. Um, touch on how do we choose the genomic DNA source when looking at whole exomes. So um, we have to consider DNA quality. So from fresh tumor, I said we have limited DNA. From the cell line, we are unlimited. The fresh tissue is heterogeneous. The cell line is homogeneous. Now, does the cell line recapitulate the tumor biology? There are different ways to find out whether a cell line would recapitulate tumor biology. Um, so how do you choose it? How do you assess it? In our case, uh, we were uh, fortunate to be able to do whole genome analysis, and this led us to, to decide which uh, DNA to use for whole exomes. So in the whole genome study, uh, we compared the fresh tumor to a cell line derived from that fresh tumor, as well as blood, and we ran it through the Illumina sequencer and looked for the uh, melanoma somatic variations. These are the build statistics, and just like uh, Jim and Les mentioned, uh, please note the uh, passing filter depth coverage. You see that it's between 34x and 67x. It's much lower than what's required uh, for exomes, obviously, because there's, it's more ho homogeneous in its coverage. And, you, and you'll see the coverage that we get for whole exomes. Um, and this allows for 92% of the callable genotypes across the entire genome. <coughs> 
So the bottom line of this study was that 97% of the alterations identified in the coding region overlapped between the fresh tumor and the cell line. However, the copy number variations were less concordant compared to the SNVs. So based on this, we decided to use the low passage cell line DNA and not the fresh tumor because we were mainly interested in finding the single nucleotide variations and we knew that we needed at least six micrograms of DNA for the whole exome and so we could derive that from the cell line but getting it from the fresh tum tumor was more of a challenge. Also, we knew that we wouldn't have stroma contamination when looking at the exomes. So we decided to do the cell lines. So uh, this is the study design. We used the exome capture. In this case, 14 tumors were done, and in parallel, the normals were done as well, so 28 exomes. In this case, the sure select um, 37 megabase was, it was used, and so we captured about 20,000 genes. Um, and this was done at NIST, so we had ELAND and then cross-matched applied. This was the discovery. Every one of these studies is followed by a validation, and the validation was done in this case using Sanger sequencing. So we've seen a couple of these uh, this morning already. This is an example from this study where you can see the BRAF gene and its exons. You can see the sure select oligos covering these various exons, and you see the coverage itself. And like I said, the coverage is um, if variable across these various exons. And that's why you need to go very much in depth in your coverage. So what quality tests do you need to do once you get your whole exome data? So these are divided into five, and we'll start off by looking at the coverage. So this is an example of some of the samples that we did. Like I said, the coverage was extremely high. It was a minimum of 180x. And this allowed to a percent target region genotype coverage of a, at 90% in average. And so this is the performance summary where you get 12 gigabases, a depth of 180x, and 90% coverage with high quality genotypes. So the next uh, item that uh, should be applied once the exomes are, are derived, uh, it's worth looking for the specificity uh, in your exomes. So um, this is um, some of the data that we got and how it was transferred into an Excel file. So what can be seen here is uh, the gene name, the reference allele, the, various, the variation allele, the same for the amino acids. And what, uh, in addition to this, we have the MPG score uh, that Jim and Jamie were talking about earlier, as well as the coverage. In this case, we're using an MPG to coverage ratio. And what we're seeing is that if you have a ratio of 0.5 and above, and this ratio occurs both in the tumor and in the normal sample, when you look at Sanger evaluation, most of the time, this is a real somatic mutation. You can rely on this alteration. However, if that ratio is below 0.5 in either one of the samples, so either in the tumor or in the normal sample, the Sanger will not uh, show you that there's a real mutation there. A different way of looking at it is this way. So if, for example, you take about 90 regions and you assess them by Sanger sequencing, they're divided like this. So the ones that are above the 0.5 ratio will validate, and the ones that are below, we won't. So this allows you to calculate your specificity. So you get 97.9% coverage rate and 2.4% false negative rate. Once you apply this, you remove 18% of the alterations. OK. Uh, the next quality test uh, is worth doing once you get your whole exome data is to look at the sensitivity. So in this case, we knew we already did candidate approaches before doing the whole exome, and so we already had 47 somatic substitutions that we expected to see in the whole exome. Out of those 47, only 38 were present in our whole exome study, which means that we had 81% sensitivity. Now, note that the missed alterations were not because they were not captured. They were captured and they were sequenced, but they were simply missed, and we're not sure why at this point.
Okay, so uh, the next item that's worth considering when looking at the exome data is the number of somatic mutations that are identified per tumor. So graphically seen, these are the various samples that were sequenced, and you can see the total number of mutations that can be seen. There's a variation, there's a certain range, but clearly there's one tumor here that has an extremely high number of, some, of mutations compared to the others. And so one needs to identify this. There's obviously a biological reason behind it, but it's worth noting it and deciding whether this is a relevant sample for this particular study. Now, of course, there could be all kinds of artifacts. Uh, these are hard to predict, but it's worth looking out for them. And so I'll give you a few examples. So uh, in one example, when we're looking at the data, uh, it's worth so we sorted it only, not only by the sample, but it's worth sorting it also by the chromosome. So in this case, it was done for patient number nine, and there seemed to be out of the ordinary a large number of somatic mutations on chromosome X. So we looked more closely at this, and we found that uh, the genotype on chromosome X in 9N, so the normal, was one allele. We knew the patient was a male. But his tumor had two alleles in the same precise location as seen in this table. So what's happening here is that there's a copy number variation, and this is an important item, especially when looking at cancer genomes, that you do have copy number variations. And so in this case, it could be a Y chromosome deletion, an X chromosome duplication. Um, you could check this, for example, by fish. We did not, but we do know that there's something going on here. And so it is worth investigating the underlying reason before including these alterations in patient number nine, on chromosome X. Okay, so uh, we went through these various quality tests. Now let's get to the actual study. So, as I said, we have a discovery screen and then we have the validation screen. So we select the tumors and then we do the exome capture, both of the tumor and the normal samples. It is worthwhile doing the normal in parallel rather than the relying, for example, on dbSNP for the various reasons that uh, at this point, Jim, Jamie, and Les were talking about. So here's an example where we used, a, we first got the 14 samples and we found over 300,000 variants versus the reference sequence. But once we applied the normal information, it went down to about 5,000. So at this point, yes, it is worth doing the normals as well. Here's the validation screen, so then you go up to validate interesting genes in a larger number of samples. I put in XX, this is obviously dependent on the number of samples that you have, but the more the better. Here you need to compare the gene mutation frequency to the expected background. And we'll get back to this later in my talk. It's very important to do this because this will allow you to find out whether the, the genes that have mutations are passenger mutations or they're candidate cancer genes. Again, I'm emphasizing the discovery and the validation screen. Uh, for budgetary constraints, this is wor worth doing uh, exactly like this, going for the discovery and then applying validation, scaling up of just a subset of the interesting genes. Okay, so uh, let's go into the uh, filtering process in more depth. So the number of potential somatic mutations are seen here. We filtered uh, through dbSNP and went down to 141,000. Then we applied the somatic filter. This was 58,000. Now, because of the limitations of capture and sequencing, some of the alterations that are actually polymorphisms could come up in another normal sample, but not necessarily the matched normal. And it's worth taking that into account because this is going to be a polymorphism. So when you find that alteration in another normal, again, you filter that out. And then you remove all the non-coding alterations and you get down to about 5,000 alterations. So um, this is again recapitulated in the, uh, this part of the slide. Uh, we have about 5,000 alterations. Now when you apply the MPG coverage ratio of 0.5, like I said, we re remove about 18%, so we have about 4,000 4, alterations. And this is the way the alterations can be divided by missense, non-sense, supply sites, insertions, deletions, and synonymous. It is important to keep track of these synonymous mutations as well, because then you can uh, find out the ratio of the non-synonymous to synonymous mutations. This is important because uh, this ratio uh, to be, is expected to be two to one if there's no selection. 
However, if there's a significant difference from the two to one ratio, it suggests that there has been some sort of selection for these mutations. And so this particular gene probably has a role to play in the cancer. So obviously, it, it tracked down these synonymous mutations. Okay. What kind of data do we need to evaluate the drivers and the passengers? So which genes really have a role to play and which are just there and they have a neutral effect? So uh, this is a challenging question. It's being dealt with a lot by the field. Uh, and this is just an attempt to answer the question. It can be answered by statistics, by informatics, and functional studies. So if we look at statistics first, as I said, the non-synonymous to synonymous ratio. If you look at the full exome study, it was two to one, suggesting that most of the alterations that were identified are indeed passengers. Mutations above background mutation rate. So when you're doing your exomes, track this down, because the background mutation rate is the number of mutations per megabase of DNA derived from all your exomes. Of course, if this is in the literature, it is worth comparing it to your numbers as well. In melanoma, the number was 11.4 mutations per megabase. Okay, the next is to see whether you have any hotspot mutations, meaning the same exact alteration in the exact same amino acid in different samples. The likelihood of this happening is extremely low, so again, it suggests this would be a driver. And then look for the highly mutated genes. So searching for the hotspots, in our case, we found nine novel genes with recurring mutations. So uh, obviously, this is only 14 samples, so we scaled it up in additional sets. And you can see it went up to a very large number of samples. And this is a summary of the uh, hotspots and how they scaled up. So this is a non-synonymous alteration. It's new. It occurs uh, in our uh, sample set six times. And in one of the cases, it's found in a commercial cell line. It is worth including commercial cell lines in your exomes, or at least in the validation step, because that allows you um, to do functional studies later on. And it also allows the rest of the community to actually have a sample that has the alteration that you identified, validated, and also do some functional studies. So another interesting point here is that we found some synonymous mutations that scaled up. So a synonymous mutation that occurred in exactly the same position in three different samples. Uh, this is interesting because, I mean, this is not going to affect the protein per se, but what is it doing? It is being selected. So it is worth capturing these as well and maybe following up on them. This is a schematic of a, one of these hotspots. And so this is a statistical test to see what's the chance of this happening by chance. In order to calculate this, you need the background mutation rate that we talked about before. And you also obviously take into account the number of samples that were sequenced. So in this case, the, the, the likelihood is extremely low. So this is being selected for, and what is it doing to the uh, function of this protein? So we know that this protein is a histone acetyl transferase, and we know that when it's disrupted in mice, it, it causes lethality and defects in cell cycle progression. Bioinformatics, obviously, is worth applying. In this case, you can see that the um, particular alteration is highly conserved in various orthologs. So again, suggesting that it is very important. If at all possible, and it's hard to predict which gene is going to be uh, found in the exomes, uh, but it is worth doing some functional analysis to completely validate and see whether the mutation has an effect on the actual function. So this is an example of a, a functional study that we did uh, where we knocked down this particular protein in a cell line that was either wild type or mutant for the protein, and we used shRNA and then check the effect of this knockdown on cell growth and apoptosis. And so when we knocked it down in cell lines that had the mutation, we could see an increase in apoptosis when there was, the cells were grown in low serum. But this did not happen when we knocked down the cell, the uh, protein in cells that were wild type for this protein. So this is uh, what's called oncogene addiction. So the cells are dependent on this particular mutation. And so when you knock it down, they're more sensitive and they will die. So, um, so it is really worth trying to do some functional studies on alterations identified. OK, the other side, looking for highly mutated genes. So in this case, there were 16 highly mutated genes. Now, what do I mean by highly mutated? 
we looked to see uh, which genes were mutated in two, at least two samples out of the 14 that were exon captured. Now, it wasn't enough to just look at the percentage of mutations, but we also needed to do a binomial test where you take into account the background mutation rate and the size of the transcript of the particular gene. So again, when we found these 16 genes, we validated them, so we scaled them up in additional samples seen here. So here you can see number four. When you look at these, when you do this p-value calculation, always take the longest transcript size of this particular gene in order to really push this uh, formula to its extreme. And then you take into account the background mutation rate as well. So uh, here's where you only consider the percentage of the tumors that are being affected. When you don't consider that p-value, if you sort it by percentage, you see these various genes that come up, and they're highly mutated. But you immediately see that, for example, Titan is in this list. Now, Titan is the largest gene in the human genome. It's a false positive. It's just because it's such a large gene, and there's such a large background mutation rate, of course it's going to be highly mutated. However, when you start applying this p-value and you sort your data, then you get a completely different table. So in this case, you get BRAF on the top of the list. It's known to be highly mutated and has the lowest p-value. And then you get these additional genes. Now, you do have a positive control here because then when you scale up in additional samples, you can see that there's a concordance between the percentage that's identified in the larger number of samples compared to the original 14 samples. So we knew that we were probably in the right direction here. And then when you look at the actual genes, we went for the second best. Brie Ralph, of course, is very well characterized. So grin 2 a was never shown to be mutated previously in melanoma, at least not highly mutated. So if you focus into this, then we did what I talked about earlier, look at, at additional cohorts to see if we can see a similar percentage in additional um, samples. So you see that indeed, when you look at these other cohorts, uh, the, it is mutated there as well. And we have the commercial cell lines here, like I uh, suggested earlier. So it is important to acquiring these additional patient cohorts. This is a schematic of the alterations in this particular protein. I'm putting it up here because it's worth a looking at the particular alterations once you have a gene of interest in COSMIC. Now, COSMIC is a database uh, developed by the Sanger Institute. It summarizes published and unpublished alterations identified in cancers, uh, different cancer types. And so if you find a particular alteration uh, in your gene of interest in COSMIC, it is likely to be important. And so it's always worth going back to COSMIC, and in this case, uh, we found two alterations exactly in the same position, and then we found a third one in COSMIC. So it's likely that this particular alteration is important. Okay, what do we do with complex exomes? So we've been talking about using cell lines, but what happens once you start using the fresh tumor? So we don't have much experience with this. Uh, we only started looking at it. Uh, we do know that when you apply the MPG coverage ratio, we can find um, particular mutations in the normal tissue, not only in the tumor. So, they, for example, we found the BRAF V600E mutation in the normal. So, clearly, there's a contamination of our normal sample with tumor cells, which is what I said could be, could be a problem. Um, also, uh, there's probably going to be heterogeneity. We haven't determined this, but that's something to keep in mind. So, probably when looking at fresh tissues, uh, different algorithms, different filters will have to be applied. Okay, so I'd like to remind that we've been obviously looking at the large number of genes in the genome, a lot of their exomes, and so you can look at genes, but also you can start looking at pathways. And this was done, for example, for pancreatic cancer, where uh, 12 core pathways were identified to be altered in this particular cancer type, which means that if you look at two different patients, even though they have different mutations in different genes, these genes still affect the exact same 12 core pathways. So uh, it is really worthwhile applying your exome data to pathway analysis and see how, uh, what kinds of pathways come up to be significant. Now, is it worth delving deeper? So we talked about 14 exomes. Uh, once you complete your first set of exomes, how do you know? Is it worth doing more or, or, or are we done? 
So this is just a graph showing the mutations per megabase identified for different cancer types. Now, since we focus on melanoma, um, I, I have these numbers right here derived from different studies. And what seems to be the case is that, at least for melanoma, there's a very large number of mutations per megabase, in some cases uh, in order of magnitude higher. So it does, seems, it does seem that it's worth doing more exomes, uh, just because there are going to be many more passengers. And so when you're doing your exomes, it's worth finding out what the mutation per megabase is, comparing it to other, sample, uh, other cancer types, and seeing, you know, I is it worth delving even deeper? So what are our future challenges? Obviously, finding out what are the drivers versus the passengers from all of these alterations. How do we analyze and interpret it, all the data? A, the functional studies are pretty important, but how do we do this in a high throughput fashion? And ultimately, how do we apply all this data back into the, the clinic? So once we have the genes, we get the pathways, but we could also integrate all of this further and see how the various pathways cross talk. And so this is the kind of database we're hoping to derive uh, from many, many exomes. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge all of these people in the slide. Thank you.